Greetings with lovers everywhere and welcome back to E-Train Talks. I'm E-Train, a 12-year-old literacy advocate, booktuber, and kindness promoter, and the host of E-Train Talks. Today's interview is sure to be an amazing and special one, for I'm with Caldecott and Coretta Scott King honoree and founding member of the Brown Bookshelf blog, author Kelly Starling Lyons. Kelly has written and contributed to over 30 books, all of which inspire and captivate readers with her ability to celebrate and promote freedom, acceptance, and growing into better people. Kelly's stories are perfect for all ages. She's written numerous picture books and outstanding chapter books, as well as great young reader stories. Kelly is an advocate for literacy and a champion of the belief that every child deserves to see themselves in the pages of the books they read. If you're searching for some excellent read-alouds for classrooms or for your young ones, Kelly's reads are sure to become beloved in your schools and households. So now, without further delay, I'm so excited to welcome Kelly Starling Lyons to Eat Train Talks. Kelly, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. This is wonderful. I'm really honored. I'm a fan. I appreciate all that you do. Oh, thank you so much. I'm a fan of you as well. Your books, as I said in the introduction, they're perfect for all ages, which is incredible because I feel that books, they should be for all ages. And your writing really demonstrates that in an amazing way. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I I always hope that my books are shared by um, kids, but also the adults who they love and who, you know, care about making sure that children's literature gets gets into the hands of the people that we're writing for. Absolutely. So my first question for you is, I'm sure most people are tuning in, are very aware of the incredible impact that you've made on children's literature. And if some of you aren't aware yet, Kelly crafts stories with important messages and themes that children and adults of all ages and backgrounds can find meaningful and learn from. Your ability to write stories that offer a window view and reflection to readers, windows and mirrors, it's just remarkable. So will you share what prompted you to write inclusive and diverse stories in the first place? Sure, thank you for that great question. So I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I was in a house that really encouraged creativity. My mom wrote children's, wrote wrote plays, um, and she took us to Children's Theater, Pittsburgh Playhouse Junior. My grandparents told us a lot about family history, and I saw people giving back through the arts in my family and in the community at large. So I was a really big reader, um, love to read everything. And then one day in third grade, um, Troll Book Club came to our school and we got a chance to pick out any book that we wanted. And I saw Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. And that book stood out because it was my first time seeing a girl on a cover who looked like me. And right away, it was like that book was saying to me that I was important and my family mattered and our history deserved to be shared and passed on. So that kind of planted a seed way back then um, I went on and I studied journalism when I was in college and I worked for newspapers and magazines. But when I worked for Ebony Magazine, one of my jobs along with writing feature articles was to be the bookshelf editor. And I started getting children's books across my desk. And one of the ones I saw was called Something Beautiful by Sharon Dennis Wyatt. It's a picture book that I think is a model for um, you know picture books that really empower children and let them know that they're agents of change. And that was a book that called me to write. I said, hey, this is a way where I can give back. This is a way that where I can help make sure all kids know that they're um, you know, valuable and that their voices matter and that they can create change where they are. So that was kind of my journey in a capsule, <laughs> but it's been you know such a wonderful ride and so rewarding. My next question for you is, so basically, I recently came across the phenomenal, I have it right here, We Rise, We Resist, We Raise Our Voices anthology, and I happened across your beautiful poem, Drumbeat for Change. It shares many profound messages, some of which include to be courageous, to speak up, to use your voice, and to be the change. For me, your poem was a timely gift. I didn't know when I started reading your poem that it would hit so close to home for me. And I'm so grateful I came across not just your poem, but the amazing and important book. It's a book whose pages are filled with yours, as well as many other amazing authors. So will you share how you came to be involved with the anthology and how We Rise, We Resist, and We Raise Our Voices really came to be in the first place? Absolutely. So 
Um, we Rise, We Resist, We Raise Our Voices was edited by Wade Hudson and Cheryl Willis Hudson, who are the founders of Just Us Books, a Black-owned, family-owned children's book publishing company in New Jersey, and who published my first two books. So they published my first book, Meet Eddie's Ordeal, which is a chapter book, and One Million Men and Me, which is a picture book. So they uh, really guided me into children's literature. They were so loving, so nurturing. They've always been in my corner. So when they got the chance to create this anthology, which really was a response to, you know, just all of the troubling times that we're in and wanting to give children hope and wanting kids to know that, you know, they can make a difference, that we have their back, you know, all of those things. And Phoebe Ye, uh, you know, really visionary editor at Random House, um, she acquired their project and then Wade and Cheryl Hudson went about thinking, you know, whose voices they could include in this anthology to kind of show, you know, range of different, um, you know, backgrounds and different people and different kinds of messages. So you'll see letters and you'll see stories and poems and there's art all the way through. And it's really just a way, it's kind of like our love letter to kids and also our um, you know, contribution as they are having to navigate, you know, all of us are, but, you know, when we think about kids having to, you know, kind of work their way through all of the different challenges, all the different forces that are at play that are really pushing against the idea that, you know, everyone should, should, should be equal and everyone should have justice. And I, you know, one of the things I really admire about kids is I, I think that, you know, young people like you have such a strong, um, innate sense of justice. And so when you have that and the world is doing something different, <laughs> we need to, you know, find ways to fortify you and affirm you and celebrate you and lift you. And so that's what we hope that we rise, we resist, we raise our voices does. And yeah. in terms of my, my contribution, Drumbeat for Change, um, I'm really so inspired by kids throughout history. Um, you know, when we think about the civil rights movement and we think about all the people that put their lives on the line, it's really important to realize kids were part of that. Children put their lives on the line. Kids went to jail. Kids, you know, sadly were being beaten, all kinds of things. And I think it's really something that can give some, um, not only context, but also empower, I hope, young people today that they have been on the front lines of change for as long as we can remember. And they always, um, you know, lead us and find their way through and they give us hope. And so I've wanted to make a connection between kids of the past and kids today. My next question is about also about your other series, 100%. Mm -hmm. I was happy to receive copies of your Jada Jones and Miles Lewis series, and I really admire all the love and work you obviously put into all of these books. For one thing, your protagonists are Black tweens, which you just don't find enough of in middle grade or really all grade levels. And the characters, though overcoming a relatable school, family, or friendship challenge, like they always find ways to make readers feel empowered and inspired. They go through a lot of the same experiences as us. But and they can kind of teach us how to overcome these challenges. We all face similar scenarios, bullies, or mm -hmm. sometimes we don't feel motivated. We don't truly understand ourselves. But your characters are great gateways to truth and to loving ourselves. So I guess that's a long winded start to a question. Right? So the question is, what is the inspiration behind creating this series? Thank you. Yeah, the inspiration was my kids and kids I meet when I go to schools and libraries and organizations. I'm such um, in such awe of the bravery of young people, their perseverance, how they're amazing friends, you know, how they um, support each other, um, how they're funny and, um, you know, how they don't shy away from from challenges. They really dedicate themselves to making their way through. So I wanted to have a series that focused on that as well as one that centered um, black, black 
young people as the stars of the story. As you said, unfortunately, we're, we're starting to have more and there have been, um, you know, Black chapter book characters throughout time, but nowhere near as, as many as we could and should, should have. So I wanted to make a contribution to that. And in the case of Jada Jones and Miles Lewis, um, both of them love science. And so when I was younger, I loved science too. My grandma's kitchen table was like my chemistry lab. Um, I also had a telescope and I collected rocks and did all these things. And so I really wanted to center kids that felt really proud and excited to uh, be curious about science and, you know, to be smart and that we're still kind of, you know, trying to figure out some friendship struggles and, you know, all those things that are typical that kids are going through at this age and stage. Uh, Miles and Jada are actually in the same class. They're in fourth grade. And so if you read the Jada Jones books, Miles is in all of those. And if you read the Miles books, Jada's in, in all of those, but they come from slightly different, you know, points of view. So Miles Lewis is the most recent series and um, he is a young man who loves sports and he loves science. He was with his mom, his dad, and his grandma. And so growing up, I was very close to my grandparents. And so I wanted to also highlight intergenerational relationships. And so you'll you'll see a lot of him with his nana and their um, you know, special relationship in the Miles books. And in uh and, and Miles is an only child too. So that's another aspect of you know, something that I wanted kids to be able to see themselves in that. And um, every book, of course, faces a different challenge. So like in Jada Jones' Rockstar, her best friend moves away and she has to find new friends. And it's finally time to do her favorite thing, which is study rocks and doing a big rock project. But her rock hound buddy is gone. So she has to find a, a way to navigate friendships and come up with a crew to do this project with her. And that brings in you know, um, a little bit of jealousy when you're trying to make a new friend and somebody already has a friend. It brings in some insecurity, different kinds of things. And Miles Lewis, King of the Ice, which is the first book of that series, um, it, it's him and his best friend. And they're kind of having some playful teasing, which goes a little bit farther. <laughs> so, you know, he has to kind of deal with that. And there's some worries about his grandmother. So I, I try to mix in, you know, friendship struggles, family struggles, while, you know, keeping the growth and the empowerment of the characters in the center. That's so great. And we all face adversity, but it's not really, it's all about how you respond. And I think- Yeah, absolutely. Your characters are great role models for all kids and even adults oh, as well. Thank you. Thank you. One of my favorite stories about Jada Jones is I got an um, email from a mom of a teacher and she said, I got some Jada books from my daughter and she shared them with her class. And there were some girls that were bullying another girl. Mm -hmm. And the teacher said to them, you know, would Jada act like that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what would Jada do? And that just meant so much to me that she was able to point to the character um, to give some some tips and, and encouragement about how to, how to be a, a good friend. And they ended up um, becoming friends after. And then one of my favorite Miles Lewis stories, the most recent book is Miles Lewis Track Star. And so I got an email from Miles Lewis, um, who is a track star. That there's a real Miles Lewis who's a track star. He runs for Puerto Rico. Oh, His cool. friend Kelly is a teacher and showed him that this book was coming out. And he reached out to me. And so we have become friends. So it's really cool, all the connections that books can bring. I'm really curious to know how, so the Miles and Jada stories feature meaningful messages like self-confidence and perseverance, which are great for readers of all kinds. But what's even um, more amazing, what's even better, is that you go about including these positive messages, as well as engaging plots in under 100 page reads. So how do you go about doing this? And why do you feel it's important to kind of keep your stories meaningful, but concise as well? Thank you for that question. So chapter books are really bridge books, you mm -hmm. know, between a picture book and a novel. And so I'm writing early chapter books. And so it's really important to, you know, have a complete story, but have it be one that doesn't feel overwhelming for the reader. And that's why these books are also illustrated um, so that you have the uh, text, but you also have the expansion of the message um, through the pictures. And so what I what I try to do is 
you know, break it into chunks because it, chapter books are really about empowering kids to feel like, oh, I'm reading a book that has chapters now. So I'm, you know, graduating up. Yeah. Um, but you don't want to make it so sim- simplistic that they don't feel like, like they, they feel like they're being written down to. So um, I, I try to keep in mind that, you know, these are growing readers. I try to keep in mind that I need to show re- respect for them and do the best job I, I can to show authenticity in terms of the feelings and the struggles that they're going through. And then I write and, you know, I, um, keep myself usually they, these books are typically under six six thousand words and I feel like the story is you know complete and doesn't need more so I love you know longer books too as kids get older they're reading um you know uh meteor uh middle grade but I hope when they read these chapter books that they still feel satisfied like they've had a complete read and they've gone on a journey with the characters as well now I'm curious to know about you. We've talked a lot about your books, your characters, but you're also a founding member of the Brown Bookshelf, as well as a huge supporter of diverse books being shared and on the shelves of classrooms, and also libraries and book fairs and more. So how did you get involved with Brown Bookshelf? How did it get started? Also, why do you think window and mirror books are needed for students? Great question. So the Brown Bookshelf um, two authors who have become dear dear friends, Paula Chase Hyman and Varian Johnson, they had this idea for bringing a collective of Black writers and illustrators together to raise awareness of Black books that were under the radar. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really important when we have books that come out that they do make their way into children's hands and they are in classrooms and in libraries because if they don't sell, it makes it harder to have more of them to come out because publishing, you know, people in publishing have huge hearts, but it still is uh, about economics. You know, the books have to sell. So this was our way to give back and try to help move the needle so that people know about the books and hopefully add them to their collections. So Paula and Varian invited me, Don Tate, and Carla Surratt for the very first group of, of the Brown Bookshelf. Started in 2007, so I've been around for a long time. And then over the years, we have grown and you know added, I think right now we have nine um, that um, authors and illustrators and they've all won awards and they've all made you know, so many awesome contributions, you know, all of the authors that we have as part of the team, they're great in their own right, but all of us have also dedicated ourselves to, to you know, lifting um, authors in our community, um, creators whose work needs to be centered and needs to be seen. So the team, just for your, you know, audience, if you want to check out who's part of it is Olubemi Sola, Rude Perkovic, Crystal Allen, Gwendolyn Hooks, Tracy Batiste, um, Varian Johnson, Don Tate. Did I leave anybody out? No. Oh, and uh, Tamika Fryer Brown. So we're the Brown Bookshelf, and we have a signature campaign called 28 Days Later, which is every February um, for you know more than a decade, where we have celebrated a different Black author or illustrator every day of Black History Month. So if you're doing an author study in your school or anything, we have a vast archive of these posts that are often self-authored by the creators themselves talking about their journey to write books, the challenges they faced, rec- recommending other authors um, for you to check out. And it just is such an important thing to me to be part of making a, a difference. The, the uh, you know, Wade and Cheryl Hudson and editors, you know, early in my career, like Nancy Paulson and Stacey Barney and you know, so, so, so many, all of my editors and my agent have, you know, paved the way for me. So I want to help any way that I can. And in terms of the windows and mirrors, that is from uh, children's literature scholar, Rudine Sims Bishop. She coined that phrase in her study. And, you know, the idea is that when we're thinking about books, you know, I was a kid that loved to read everything and every turn of the page and we feel like I was part of the story. Um, it's actually windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors. So that's the sliding glass door where you feel like you're actually part of the story world. And then there's the window where you're looking through, you know, your eyes and your mind into this other place. Like one of my favorite books growing up was Wrinkle in Time. Oh. And so, you know, I felt like I was with Meg on that journey, you know, and, and, and all that. But then we have the mirrors 
where kids, all kids need to be able to see themselves, see their friends, see their parents, right. see their families, see their communities represented on the page. Because if you don't, books can feel, you know, like strangers instead of friends. You know, we, we want to showcase the beautiful diversity of the world and make sure that the, um, you know, scope of and, and and the range of cultures and backgrounds that we come across and you know people in our daily lives that we can walk to the shelf and you know pull that off and you know see that represented too so that's that's why I think it's so important to advocate for diverse books and I'm so grateful to my colleagues on the brown bookshelf so we need diverse books to people like Vanessa Lois Scambati who um, has celebrated more than 30 years of the African-American Children's Book Fair in Philadelphia to the Hudson's of Justice Books. There's so many people that are doing this work and making a difference to you. So thank you for what you're doing. Um, and I just think that if if we keep pushing and we keep trying, that we're going to make the change that kids deserve. So my next question for you is, well, actually, it is about book banning. <laughs> <laughs> you know, perfect segues. Yes. So What's your opinion on the increase in book banning throughout the United States, the mass book banning? If, mm -hmm. What are some ways we can stop the books from being challenged and banned? How can we promote them and put them in the hands of even, of even more readers? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really troubling on multiple fronts, um, the, the, the different ways that, um, you know, kind of open thinking and um, access is being curtailed and um, you know challenged, and I, I I think book banning is a part of that. And you know when we think about books and the power that they have to inspire people and you know make you feel valued, um, children's literature is all about giving hope and you know showing love. I mean, even in the tough tough stories, we're reflecting back what's going on, and hopefully there's something. That a child can take away to make the day a little brighter or know that they're not alone. And so to, you know, when we think about all these books that are being chat and, and sometimes it's not even an outright ban, people are putting in place yeah. challenges which pull the books from the shelves as they're being evaluated indefinitely at times. And so it's a scary time, it's a troubling time, but I'm really encouraged by all the ways that people are, are you know, rallying together and um, speaking out. One of the things um, earlier on in York, Pennsylvania, there was a, and you know, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So I, you know, seeing books banned in Pennsylvania caught my eye because, you know, some sometimes we think, oh, it's only certain states. It is not. The banning's happening everywhere. So in York, Pennsylvania, when there was this list of banned books, I absolutely was so inspired by the kids and the teachers who fought against it and spoke passionately and eloquently for why all books need to be open and have access. And they were successful. And so I think that's a model that we can follow, you know, making sure mm -hmm. that parents have a voice, make sure that the kids have a voice, make sure the teachers and the media specialists and the librarians that that they are heard. Um, I I think that you know, whenever we have these, um, you know, have these opportunities to have lists of books that are created to make sure if you have access to be part of a, um, you know, school committee or, you know, you can, you can join places where you can have more, more of a voice so that it's not just, you know, certain people that are making decisions for all of us, <laughs> that we have more voices in the room. Um, I think those are things that can really help. I think too, when we have the chance to donate books, there used to be something, I don't know if it's still around, it was called the Birthday Party Pledge. And it was about when you're giving books, you know, for a kid's birthday, that you wouldn't just give books that feature kids that look like that child, but that you would give diverse books, which I think is, yeah. is, is, is really awesome. And so that's another thought, you know, making sure that, when you're giving books, you're showcasing diversity. When you have book fairs, that there's books, you know, featuring kids of all different backgrounds, all different places, all different circumstances. And when you do learn about a challenge to a book that you speak up, whether it's on social media, whether you're writing letters, whether you're calling people, organizing, and, you know, 
rallying together is 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 how we um, combat any you know um, dis disparity that we're facing throughout time. You know, when we see the power of people who are uniting, that's how we make a difference. So I would say thank you to everybody who's already doing that. You know, you inspire me. I'm so proud, and let's keep going. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what you said. Well, everything that you said is so profound, but especially how a lot of people think that books are being banned in just states like Florida or mm -hmm. Texas, but yeah. they're really being challenged, not necessarily banned everywhere. They are. Yeah. Like yeah. people think, oh, I live in California, and people think that California is the safest place for no book bans. And while there have been some laws that are passed, there's still countless challenges from right. like horrible organizations like Moms for Liberty who don't even read the books. Mm -hmm. yeah. there's one book that was I'm oh, sorry no no I, I, I was just just, just going to say to your point earlier about there being more bands I think you know I, I, I would be hard pressed to think of a, a author friend of mine who has not had a book band and I wouldn't have been able to say that five years ago right so something is definitely changing and it's not 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 for the better yeah yeah and what's even more sad is that there's this one book um, that was on our band list, or at least challenged. It there was nothing bad, nothing that other organizations would want to take off the shelves. It was just because the author's last name was Gay. Mm. That's all that it was. It's mm. just they just look up keywords. That's yeah. all. It's, it's just awful, you know. And mm -hmm. I I think that you know when, when we're thinking about when we, it, when I go back to whenever I was younger and didn't really see myself. Um, even though I had awesome teachers and I loved school, right. but I didn't see myself in the books until I saw that, you know, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry in a um, Troll Book Club catalog. And that set me on this journey to end up as a children's book author. So when we don't, when kids feel invisible and when they don't feel heard and they don't feel the love on the page, you know, how many dreams are you dashing? You know, so right. I think it's really crucial that we take this seriously and that we get behind making sure that LGBTQIA books are accessible, making sure books about, um, you know, that, that feature Black and Native characters, that feature people of color, that, that feature women, you know, mm -hmm. all of those things that, uh, you know, different people for, for many different reasons are taking issue with. We need to, you know, rally and just say that that's us, you know, we're all one, we all matter. Um, and that we stand for equality and justice. So in doing research for our talk, I read that you said that all kids deserve to be seen and all kids need to know that they can be children's book creators too. And you went on to say that when you see authors and artists who look like you, it can inspire you to write and illustrate your own stories. Mm -hmm. So we talked about this a little bit, but were there any other stories either growing up or when you were an adult that kind of explain kind of made you feel the same way that you describe how authors and artists who look like you can inspire others and really I'm curious why do you feel that this is so important for kids yeah so I think I go back for a minute to seeing something beautiful by Sharon Dennis Wyeth so I was an editor at Ebony Magazine and this book comes across my desk. And when I look at the cover, it's this little, it's this sweet faced girl with um, bollies and barrettes in her hair with plaits, like I, how I used to wear my hair. And I'm looking at her and the title, Something Beautiful. And immediately, um, you know, kind of curious and captivated. And then I open the book and I see there's a scene where the teacher writes the word beautiful on the board. And then the little girl, uh, the main character, goes around the, her community, neighborhoods, looking for what other people consider beautiful. And for some, it's their baby's laugh or the smooth stone that's been carried in this man's pocket or a shiny apple on the stand. And then she goes home and she sees broken glass on the ground and graffiti on the wall and asks herself, where's my something beautiful? And then she creates change by cleaning up the glass and scrubbing the graffiti off the wall and her mom says she's the most beautiful one of all and like I said that was a book that called me to write for kids I had never seen a book have that kind of power to be so spare it's a picture book so we're not talking about lots of words okay. to be so poetic but to be so powerful another book that did that early on for me was Visiting Day by Jacqueline Woodson 
Jacqueline Woodson is one of my favorite um, authors. I love everything she writes, but I'm particularly drawn to her picture books. Um, and Visiting Day was a little girl who's is with her grandmother and her dad is in prison. And, um, you know, it's kind of this buildup to going to see her dad. And on the other side, her dad being excited about her coming to visit. And just to show, you know, that just 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 to show that they're the everyday love that is shared, that we share in our homes, that people share everywhere, just because someone is behind bars does not mean that they are not the same as us and don't have those connections and those, you know, yearnings to be with those that they love. So I I am a big fan of picture books. I think they do such an excellent job of making um, unsung heroes, bringing them forward, of making emotions and um, connections that we don't always spend time really exploring and understanding um, come into focus. And so, you know, another point I want to make is early when I uh, started writing for kids, I went to the Highlights Writers Workshop at Chautauqua, and one of the um, keynote speakers was uh, Patty Gouch, who's an award-winning author and editor. And she said her advice to us was write the story only you can tell. And that's advice that I've taken from then to now. And I always think back and I always share that. I can share that with your listeners because all of us have things that we've been through, different challenges, or we have, you know, things that matter to us, our passions. We think about who we are, what, what makes us who we are. We think about whose we are, our family, our, our community, our faith. And then you think about where you're from your heritage, your home. And those are the things that make stories special just by being you. It's just not enough. It's actually everything. So I love the idea that there is no magic formula to being an author. I think sometimes kids think, oh my gosh, it's such a, you know, wonderful thing, but it can feel out of reach. Right. And so every person as not one story, not 10, not a hundred. We all have thousands of stories inside of us that are wait, you know, waiting to be told. And those are your stories to tell. You and I can write about the same thing, but those stories are going to be completely different because mm-hmm. they have our worldview and our experience behind it. And so that's what I, I hope when kids read my book, that maybe they think about stories they could tell too, because they are the best ones to tell their own stories. So my final question of the interview is one that I've asked every person that I've ever interviewed. Okay, great. If you could be or meet any literary character, you could meet your favorite author Mm -hmm. or your favorite book character, who would it be and why? Ooh, that's so hard. Well, you know, I've I've said Jacqueline Woodson is my all-time favorite, and I've had the honor of meeting her, hanging out with her. Uh, Yeah, we actually share an editor. Some uh, some of my books have been edited by Nancy Paulson, who's at Penguin. And that's Jackie's editor, long, long, long time editor. So that has been wonderful. But, you know, when I think historically about somebody who I would love to meet, I think about, um, I think that there's a, there's a series and it's called, and it's, it's by Lu- Lucille Clifton and it's Everett Anderson. And she takes this, this little boy character and he goes through all different things. He goes through loss and he goes through you know, um, you know, waiting, you know, waiting for his dad to come home. He goes through all these different kinds of things and, you know, really was a pioneer for me in following a character of, uh, you know, kind of centering a a Black character, making that character kind of a friend for the reader, and then taking you through their different um, daily lives and showing the struggles and the joys and the, and, and the different emotions. So I would have loved to have met Lucille Clifton who was a pioneering, you know, wonderful poet, as well as children's book author. That is an amazing answer. And I would love to meet her as well. And I also, now I have a new book to add to, or new series (laughs) to add to my to-be-read pile. Yeah, thank you. One of my favorites in that series is Everett Anderson's Goodbye, which deals with loss. And, you know, right now, as we talk about troubling time, there's, there's a lot of people that are dealing with loss, you know, from the pandemic on there, there's been, you know, just this heaviness. And so I think, you know, books can be safe spaces to figure out tough things. So I could recommend that Everett Anderson's goodbye to your audience. It's a great recommendation. And 
This has been such an inspiring interview for me and I'm sure for everybody who's listening. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today, Kelly. Thank you. And it's such an honor. You know, I've, I've been watching my, my friend Tori was on your show and, yeah. and other people. And I said, I mean, maybe one day I'll talk to each And here I am. Yeah. <laughs> so Tori thank you for you having me. Yeah, thank you. You and Tori are both the best. Like, Oh, thank you. We think the, you're the best. Oh, well, <laughs> I got to meet Tori in New York. Maybe I'll get to meet you in person one day as well. I would love that. Yeah, I don't I don't get to California often, but when I do, what what, what part of California are you in? Uh, Sacramento, so kind of okay. like right in the middle. Okay, well, if I'm ever up that way, I will surely look you up. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. And if I'm ever in Pennsylvania, I'll be sure to well, go. I actually there. live now in Raleigh. So I'm in Raleigh. North, I knew North that. Carolina. I knew that. Yeah, I knew that. But I'm born and raised in Pittsburgh, so I could be in Pittsburgh or I could be in Raleigh. <laughs> so if I'm ever in Raleigh, then yeah, yes. North Carolina, I'll be sure to look you up. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and that's all the time we have today, everybody. I'm, I've been speaking to the wonderful author, award winner, Kelly Starling Lyons. She's a celebrated author whose stories left a profound mark in this children's book world, left a profound mark on me and probably after this interview on you as well. Her stories are just amazing. They celebrate diversity and inclusion and are windows and mirrors and sliding glass doors for readers of all ages to enjoy. Kelly is a trailblazer in youth literature, and it's been an honor getting the chance to share her story with all of you. To find out more about Kelly, you can find her on most social media sites and at kellystarlinglions.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Keep Until next time, keep on reading. And by reading, I mean read some of Kelly's books. They are the best. And stay safe, and I'll see you in the next one.